about the kingdom of God and we talked about the fact that John the Baptist came preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and then the scripture says that he baptized Jesus and Jesus went out into the wilderness fasted 40 days and 40 nights was tempted by the devil and we know he overcame all that temptation the scripture says that he returned from the wilderness in the power of the spirit and went about preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> so when we think about the fact that John the Baptist preached this kingdom of heaven or this kingdom of God, and we think about the fact that Jesus preached this kingdom of heaven or this kingdom of God, and then we realize that when he sent out the twelve and the seventy, the message he gave them was go preach repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then we realize that it is a message that must be important or Jesus would not have pursued it the way that he did. Now when we examine the truth that he pursued it the way he did, then we come to the scripture that tells us when the gospel of the kingdom is preached to the nations with a witness, then the end will come. So we have a message to preach, this gospel of the kingdom, and it is the message that when it is preached, Jesus can return once it's preached to the nations. Now we know that that's not done yet. We know that we have not completed the task of preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the nations with a witness because Jesus hasn't come yet. So we know that we still have work to do and we as uh, pulpit ministers or teaching ministers, uh, those of us who stand before people and declare the truths of scripture, we should examine what we preach and teach. We don't need any more opinions. We need some truth. We need truth that we can stand on. Brother Arthur came in today with a word of knowledge for you and a word of wisdom for you and a word of encouragement from you and he founded it on the word of God. Because the truth is we don't have to be concerned about what's going on around us. Now, the scripture says that we should watch what's going on around us and we should know what the season is and we should be able to look at what's happening and determine where we are in the history of this age or this dispensation. If we're faithful to do those things, then we will know based on what we see that I believe the time of Jesus' second coming and the calling away or the catching away of the church is closer than it's ever been. I believe that with my whole heart. I look around me, that song Sister Lawanda sings when she's here, I look around me, I see prophecies fulfilling. And I look around me every day and I see the prophetic words and the visions of John in Revelation, I see those coming to pass, and as I watch those things happen, I realize that we are closer than we've ever been. Now listen, it would be easy for me to say and to agree with you that we've heard that our whole lives. We have heard it our whole lives. Jesus is coming back. We've heard that Jesus is coming and he's going to set up his kingdom in the earth and we're going to rule and reign with him a thousand years in the earth. Amen. We've heard that. We know that to be true. Yes. Amen. What happens is sometimes when we hear things over and over and we don't see them happen, we begin to kind of just drift away from them. Or we forget them. Or we don't take them as seriously as we used to because we have not seen them happen. But listen, my faith is in the return of Christ. And faith is that thing that is in me that believes or knows that what I haven't seen yet is still true. Mm -hmm. I didn't see Jesus walk on water, but I know in my heart that he did. Yes. I didn't see him cleanse lepers, but I know in my heart that he did. How do I know that he healed lepers? Because I've seen him heal people around me of cancer. I've seen him heal people around me of all kinds of diseases. And I've watched him be whole and healed. Now listen, now let, let's talk about that. I don't know why I'm wandering in this, but we're going to stay here a minute because I just feel it. Listen. The prophet Isaiah in, 50, in Isaiah 53 said, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. And we believe those scriptures and we pray those scriptures and we stand on those scriptures. But listen, y'all. There's another scripture that has to be set on that one line upon line and precept upon precept. 
It says, it is appointed to every person once to die. And then the judgment. So there will come a time when we will not be healed in our bodies. Here's what I believe. This is the gospel according to Joel, okay? I believe that if a sickness or infirmity attacks my body, that I can pray and be healed. But I also believe that when I come to the end of my days on this earth, that I can pray till the cows come home. I can be anointed with oil and I can have hands laid on me over and over and over and over. But when it's my day to go home, I'm going home. Amen. Because it's appointed to every person once to die and then the judgment. The key to life for us is that we don't look with fear or anxiety toward the day of our leaving. Because the scripture says we should rejoice at the going out and weep at the coming in. We get it backwards. Somebody has a baby, we get all excited. We throw showers and parties and we buy them diapers and we buy them baby clothes and we dress up their crib and their nursery room and we're excited. And I understand that I have five boys. Five times I've been excited. Five times I've been disappointed along the way. But five times I've been excited. But listen, when we know someone leaves this earth, blood bought, born again, and going home to see Jesus, that's a time to shout. Yes. Not a time to weep. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity in this facility to go to the bedsides of at least four people, maybe five, four for sure, mm -hmm. and to pray with them and their family just before they left. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you something. In every one of those situations and circumstances, those people were born again, and when they were leaving this earth, they were leaving the brokenness and the debauchery and the sickness of mankind. One of them I went by request because the child of one of them was concerned about where their father was with the Lord. Huh. I tell you what, we had revival in that room. I went in and, and I spoke with him for a few minutes and I said, Brother, how are things with you and the Lord? He said, We're good. We've been good for a long time. And this smile came on his face. And he testified of his experience with the Lord and all the times the Lord had been with him and performed the miraculous in his life. And he testified of some of the things that had happened in his life throughout his life that only God could have done. I like to get those witnesses. I just had to do a funeral. Brother J.B. Baker. Brother Baker was an elderly man in our church. Brother Baker was 82. He was at church on Sunday morning. Came in on his cane like he always did. A little slower than he used to. In the three years that I've led our men's fellowship, Brother Baker never missed a man. Well, he missed two. He had to have his gallbladder taken out. He missed that one. And then he forgot one time. And after that, I called him every day at noon on the day of men's fellowship to remind him. But Brother Baker was, was born again. He was a, an example to the men in our church. He was a powerful brother, and he was faithful to the house of God. And this is how I want to go. Y'all ready? He was at church Sunday morning. He was at church Sunday night. Sunday night... I felt prompted to go over and kneel down by him and tell him how much I appreciated him and loved him, and I gave him a kiss on the cheek when I got up and walked away. I wouldn't take a million dollars for that today. Mm -hmm. The next morning, Brother Baker went into his kitchen, got him a cup of coffee and two Twinkies. I didn't say he was healthy. I said he was faithful. He got him two Twinkies and a cup of coffee, and he took four steps into his den had a massive heart attack and went home to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't drink much coffee. I like Coke. But when I get ready to go, I want me two Twinkies. Preferably the chocolate ones with the white cream in them. And the little white swirl on top. And a big old glass of Coke. I'll be good to go home like that. And when y'all heard I've gone like that, the next Wednesday in this room, y'all better have some Twinkies and some coke and shout my out of here amen 
I'm looking forward to being out of this mess. Anyway, I don't know why we did all that, but thank the Lord. So last week when we started talking about this kingdom, we talked about John the Baptist preaching, Jesus preaching, and sending out the 12 and then the 70 to preach it. And then he told us in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission not only to preach the gospel but to baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them all things I have commanded you. Mm-hmm. There's the failure of church leadership right there. Yeah. We spend all of our time preaching hoping one person will get saved. Let's just be honest. And there'll be a church full of other folks that's been born again but they've had no training They haven't been taught what Jesus commanded. Mm -hmm. And we can't lose sight of one for the other. Nor can we lose sight of the other for the one. So we have to sometimes, we have to somehow manage the processes of church leadership to get us to the point that we are in a place that we are teaching you all things he commanded. And that's all my heart is for this house. When I come in here on Wednesdays, my heart is that if there are some of you who need to be born again, and on two occasions, we've had people in this room come to me or talk to me after the service and tell me I've never been saved. They got saved in this room. And I am so appreciative of that. But at this point in our lives together, isn't it a little more important for us because you wouldn't be here today if you didn't love Jesus. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't following Jesus. Amen? <coughs> be watching TV or sleeping or... Or you can do anything you want to do. It's a nice day. You can go sit outside. So I'm honored that you come here. But the truth is my responsibility is to lead you in the path of righteousness. And the only righteousness I have to lead you in is what the Word of God teaches us. That's right. Amen. <laughs> so we talked about last week this gospel of the kingdom. And we talked about how we are John 3, 3, except a man be born again. He can't see the kingdom. And then John 6 except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom. So we talked about last week seeing it and entering it. I kind of titled this series we're doing, Lord, Tell Us About Your Kingdom. Today I want to talk a little bit about this supernatural birth into this kingdom Mm -hmm. and why we're born into the kingdom. It's nice to escape hell. But what Jesus did is a whole lot bigger than fire insurance. It'll come to you. Stay with me. Jesus died so that we could be born again. And the the sole purpose of that was not so we would escape the fires of hell, but so that we could live an abundant life. Jesus himself said, The thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and have it more abundant. Amen. So the truth is the time we have on this earth is so small in comparison to eternity. Jesus described it like a vapor. A vapor. And we've all sprayed a spray bottle and seen the vapor that comes out of it and immediately it's gone. You can't see it anymore. That's what he talked about life on earth being like. This life is so important though, however, that we must make a choice in this life that affects eternity. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So I have to make a choice in this life that's going to affect my eternity. And I used to try to wrap my head around eternity. And I tried to wrap my head around and relate it to time. But about a year ago, I came to the realization that eternity has nothing to do with time. In fact, eternity is the absence of time. Now think about that. Because we see time as a line, has a beginning, has an end. My day started this morning at... 547 and it'll end sometime tonight, 10, 30, 11 o'clock when I finally fall out and go to sleep. And when I fall out and go to sleep tonight, that day will be over until I wake for the next one. So my day is timed from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. My work is timed from the time I start to the time to be done. 
<laughs> My time at church tonight will start at 7 and we'll be faithful to start at 7. By 8.30 we'll be finished. We'll be taking the trash out, cleaning it up, getting ready to go home. So everything is measured on this line of time. But when we look at the kingdom of God, we have to look at time in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Christ Himself who is the King, and we have to realize that time begins in Him. <laughs> I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. And time with the Lord is not on a line but on a circle. And it starts in Him. And it ends in Him. <laughs> and even He identifies time to go back farther than the natural we can relate to because he says that he was crucified before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. And he says that those who endure to the end shall be the saved and I will cause them to sit down in my throne and with me and we shall rule for eternity. Mm -hmm. The absence of time. What a concept. But today I want to talk about how supernatural this entry into the kingdom is. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 we read, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's the New King James Version. The New Living Translation says He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness. The English Standard says He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. The American Standard says He has delivered us from the power of darkness, just like the New King James. I like this one. This is Young's literal translation. It says, He has delivered us from the authority of darkness. The authority of darkness. All of those words represent a powerful place. Domain. Power. Authority. Kingdom. And I realize that though they are a description of a powerful thing or a powerful place, that none of them have any power over me if I do not submit myself to them. I am blessed to work for myself some days. Some days it's a curse. But I work for myself. I have my own construction business. And so I, I, my boys, my five boys, not the 26-year-old, not the 23-year-old, the 18-year-old is coming to understand it. But the 15-year-old still thinks that's really cool. Dad works for himself. I don't work for myself. I work for the people that hire me to build something for them. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe it, watch how I act when my phone rings and it is one of them. That is how I provide food and clothing for my family. That is how I provide a house over their heads, a roof over their head, Thank running you. water both ways, in and out. So though I work for myself, I have to submit myself to the domain, the dominion, the power, or the authority of those people who I have signed a contract with. Mm -hmm. Because I have set out the guidelines under which I submit myself to them. Many of our issues in life come from our inability to submit ourselves to someone or something. I spent 35 years of my life in total rebellion. If you wanted me to act the fool, you act like you could tell me what to do. When you start acting like you could tell me what to do, I show you how little authority you had over me. I show you how little dominion you had over me. I will do things just to show you I can do them. And we can't live our lives in that kind of rebellion and be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light or into the kingdom of His dear Son. Anytime that we take on the attitude that we are going to do whatever we want to do, however we want to do it, whenever we want to do it, we've taken on the attitude of the kingdom of darkness. Because it is rebellion that caused Satan to be thrown out of heaven. If you'll remember, if 
you'll remember Satan was in the beginning Lucifer, the most beautiful angel of heaven. He was the musician of heaven and he covered the throne where God sat. And music came out of every part of his body. He was created so that when his body moved, it made music. And one day, he thought, wow, I'm pretty good at this. I think I'll make me a throne above God's. And when he declared that, he was thrown out of heaven. Jesus said something like this. He said, Don't be surprised you have authority over demons. I saw Satan cast out of heaven like lightning. He got gone quick because of his rebellion to the authority of God. The only way that we can walk in this kingdom of God is to submit ourselves to the authority of God. To do anything less than that is to pattern ourselves after the rebellion of Satan and risk the opportunity of being cast out of the kingdom. That's heavy stuff. I don't like it. I don't like talking about it. But it's part of what we have to understand about the kingdom. All of the words that represent this darkness that we came out of into this light, this Jesus. And y'all stay with me a minute. This is kind of sad and bitter, but in a minute it's going to get better because we're going to talk about that other kingdom. But we're all born into this kingdom of darkness where the thing that rules in our life is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I like it. I want it. It feels good. I'm going to do it. And now after I've accumulated all of this stuff in my own pride, I say, look what I got. That is full submission to the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. My wife, I'm a sports fan. I like SEC football. I wouldn't give you a nickel for NFL football. I don't give to never play another game. It's a bunch of crazy people getting paid way too much to play a game. However, I am an SEC football fan. My wife says to me, you should not watch football. I said, why in the world not? She said, because it is the epitome of the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I cannot argue with that. Therefore, I do not play football. I watch it. <laughs> we have to understand that to whoever we render our members, we are a slave to that person. I talked about working for my customers, my clients, who I signed a contract with to build them I Listen, when I sign that contract and hand them that piece of paper, I have enslaved myself to them until that contract is fulfilled. Now, a lot of people don't like to look at it like that, but let's just be real. That's what it is. Because this morning I got up and I wanted to finish my message for today, but the phone rang and my customer was out there wanting to know where the electrician was. So I put on my blue jeans and my t-shirt and I went to find the electrician mm -hmm. because I am enslaved to this customer until this house is finished. Amen? If we've been translated or if we have been um, delivered from this power of darkness and we've been conveyed into the kingdom of His Son, then we have to do what the King says. So once we have been born again and we've been moved out of our sin and, and out of our old flesh man and all the stuff he did, if we've been moved from there into this kingdom of light, this kingdom of his dear son, now we've got to do different because we've got a different king. See, i got two customers right now. They're brothers-in-law. they both got 15 acres each divided by a driveway. One of them is a doctor, and he's building a castle. The other one is a math teacher at Walter State. He's building half a castle. Okay? I can't work for both of them the same. Because when I work for the doctor, all he wants to know is how much is the check need to be. But his brother-in-law, they're married to sisters, his brother-in-law wants to know, why did you spend that much? Because <laughs> he's a mathematician. So I can't treat them the same way or work for them the same way. They got tickled at me. I had to go to a meeting with both of them at the same time, a banker and a material supplier. 
They invited me to this meeting where it was going to take place in the conference room at the doctor's office in Morristown. So I'm thinking, well, I got to dress for the doctor's office, but I got to make the math teacher that wears blue jeans and his t-shirt hanging out all the time. I got, to, I got to be comfortable with both of them. How do I do this? I don't want to offend anybody. So I dressed for the doctor and left my shirt tail out. <laughs> what would you have done? Huh? I didn't have a better plan than that. <laughs> and I, I told them that. Well, I offended the math teacher. Because the next day at the job, I walked up with my shirt tail out. He said, I see you dressed for me today. <laughs> I said, bro, I did not mean to offend you. It was a joke. It was a joke. I'm going to wear my shirt tail out at church tonight. <laughs> Back Sunday morning in my sport coat, I'm going to have my shirt tail out. Because that's comfortable. But I can't treat them the same. I can't walk in the kingdom of Jesus, the way I walked in the kingdom of my flesh or the kingdom of Satan when he was dictating everything that I did. Listen, I can't do the things I did in the kingdom of darkness in the kingdom of light. Lord Jesus, I can't do them things over there. I start telling you what some of them were. You don't even need to know. But I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't serve the Lord the way I serve Satan. Mm -hmm. And until we're born again, that's who we're serving. There are only two supernatural powers in the universe. The power of Satan, the power of God. So for us to think we're okay, we're doing good, I, I'm a good guy. I have people tell me that all the time. I say, you're born again? Yes, sir. Number one. Sir? I said, go number one. Go number one, that's right. The kingdom of God. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. Put it right there, all right? We have to understand that as we're translated this kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, we take on a new king, we take on a new set of rules, we take on a new life. And even Jesus understood that the old man couldn't function in the new kingdom. That's why Paul wrote, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. Because the old man can't live in the new kingdom. That's right. And we're only delivered from the old kingdom to the new kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. He said, Arise, shine, for your light has come, speaking of Jesus. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you. So I'm going to be different. I'm going to look different. I'm going to act different. I'm going to reveal the glory of the Lord instead of the darkness of my flesh. If y'all don't believe we live in a world full of darkness, just read sometime about what they're doing out there. It's crazy. Do you know right now, federal government funding under the last administration was cut off to one of the states in the United States because of this law. You ready? They enacted this law, and this is what it reads. Almost verbatim. Almost got it memorized. In, the, in this state, I almost said which one it was. In this state, a person will use the bathroom that is signified on their birth certificate. Now tell me, what in the world is wrong with that? Huh? What is wrong with that? Now, I get there are a lot of folks don't care which bathroom they use, okay? I got a seven-year-old boy. I don't want women in his bathroom while he's in there using. Is that all right? Is that all right? And if I had daughters, I don't have three generations of boys till my oldest boy messed it up. We got little Auburn Renee. She's two and a half. Spoiled rotten because she's the only girl in three generations. All she got to do is act like she's going to whine, and all of them show up. <laughs> But the truth is, when she's old enough to go to the restroom by herself, I don't want men in there with her. Is that all right? Now, it ain't politically correct. And I, if I get in trouble today for saying it, it won't be the first time. <laughs> they won't have a virgin. I've been in trouble before. But it's just the truth. 